Hey, and welcome to Winning Conversations. We have a treat for you guys today. We sit down with Dennis O'Neill, and some of you guys know him from Heritage, and some of you will know him from some of the movies he's been in and the incredible things he's done in the acting world. So this is a jam-packed episode, lots of incredible stories, how he was really an influence in the acting world um, all throughout his career and how he's still making an impact for the Lord in it. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, the thing I think is so important for us to kind of set the stage, I'm always curious as someone who's new to the Heritage family, relatively speaking, like how did you, like, how did you find Heritage? What, what brought you to Heritage? What was that connection that, that keeps you here? Oh, to Heritage? Heritage of Faith, yes, sir. Oh, oh so w- when I received the Lord, uh, we went out to this church called Faith of God's Word Ministries, and um, I told the pastor that I was, I was a New York City cab driver, which I was. I did a lot of different jobs. I was also um, a limousine driver, picking up stars and th- things like that. And I said to him, uh, you know, I just bought a new car. It was a, uh, I forgot the year, um, but it was a, an Eldorado Cadillac. And I said, uh, it's got leather seats. So I want to be the transporter of the ministers that come speak at our church. Mm. And he said, great, great. We're going to have Jerry Savell. And I said, um, Jerry Savelle, the, the guy that we saw in D.C.? And he said, yeah. I said, oh, my gosh, Carmen and I loved him. And I said, okay, great. So uh, I went out to LaGuardia Airport, picked him up, and we were talking. And he said, oh, El Dorado, I have the same car. Mine is blue. So, you know, we kind of hit it off about talking about the cars. And as I'm driving... Uh, let me back up a little. People in the church told me when I received the Lord, they said, you've got to get out of acting. You're in the devil's playground. You cannot do this. You're unequally yoked. They, they brought all these scriptures into it. I was a baby Christian, so I didn't know. And, and now I'm feeling, okay, but what do I do? Because that's what I was doing for a living. I'm an actor. What do I do? And um, uh, I, I was also a part-time waiter at Wolf's uh, Delicatessen in Manhattan. And and I'm thinking, what, what do I do? What do I do? And so every time I was in a film, and if it was on a Wednesday night, I had to tell Carmen, don't tell people where I am. Just tell them that I had to work because I'm on this film and I don't want anybody to know it. I started feeling guilty. Then I thought, you know, maybe because I'm a baby Christian, God's going to talk to you to tell you, uh, to tell you, to tell me what to do. And you know, I wasn't one for people telling me what to do either. <laughs> and um, what? So uh, <laughs> uh, I, I remember I, I just got so fed up. And I said to my wife, I said, you know what? If this is the devil's playground, I'm going to go into the devil's playground, start a church and kick the sucker out of the, out of the neighborhood. So I, I started having Bible studies at my apartment, my one bedroom, small apartment on Monday night in Manhattan. And I would invite all these actors over and people were receiving the Lord and we were praying for the entire industry. So any name that you came up with, you would throw that name out and we pray for them. So we prayed for Robin Williams, Sylvester Stallone, Robert De Niro. I mean, we prayed for everyone and it was just great. So let me go back to when I went to my pastor, I told him what I was doing. And, and I said, and I'm also, um, you know, I was a New York City cab driver. So I go to LaGuardia Airport, and I tell you all of that for this. As we're driving, Dr. Seville said, so what do you do for a living? And I said, well, you know, I'm doing this ministry part-time. He said, no, but I mean, wh- what do you do? And I said, well, um, and I didn't want to tell him I was an actor because so many people was, they were convicting me of being an actor. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and you know, he's like, he's next to the Pope, which is (laughs) Kenneth Copeland. (laughs) So, you know, he's going to, I know he's going to say something to me. And I said, uh, well, brother Savelle, um, uh, I'm, I'm an actor, but I'm getting out of it and, and I'm going more into the ministry he said, oh, what kind of acting do you do? And I'm thinking, oh, man, now he's really going to give it to me. And I said, well, film, mostly film and television. He said, oh, you know, I, I ministered to John Voight and a few other actors. And I said, oh, really? Yeah, well, well, I'm getting out of it. He said, uh, why? 
And I was stunned. I said, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say because people told me yeah. to. Huh. And anyway, we had, so it was an hour's drive and we had a great talk. And man, that is what set me free. And we gained a really good relationship. And uh, in 1985, 83, I got ordained through Buddy Harrison. 85, we, we were ministering at churches here. And I believe Dr. Savelle opened up the doors. And we went to Grace Temple, Pastor Harold Nichols. And um, so Pastor Harold said, can you get up and do it? Brother Jerry told me that you do. And because I did impersonations of Rocky <laughs> going to church. Mm-hmm. Hey, yo, Adrian. Hey, yo, Adrian, I'm saved. And I, so I, in, my, in my concerts, I would sing and do all these impersonations. And uh, Pastor Harold Nichols said, so y- you do Popeye? And I said, yeah, yeah. He said, can you do that out there? I said, yeah. Um, said, like a Sunday service? Yeah. It, oh, it was... Well, it was yeah, I believe it was a Sunday service. And he said, can you can you just show me? And Brother Nichols had this thick Texas accent. He said, well, can, can, can you show me? And he had a high voice. So I, I said, yeah, sure. Oh, skip it a Oh, praise the Lord. Where's me spinach? Oh, k- 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 and um, That's then he good. said, <laughs> he said what good. else do you do? And I said, well, you know, I do the Godfather. He said, the Godfather, let me see it. My name is Pastor Don Corleone, and I want to make an offer you can't refuse. Ooh. And so Lou, also, his guys, wife, started you guys don't laughing. Get the, the, the visuals here, yeah, but they're hilarious. also spot on. <laughs> <laughs> so then he said, just do whatever you're going to do. And it usually takes about an hour. He said, can you do it in 15 minutes? And I said, anything you want. And I'm thinking, how am I going to do this in 15 minutes? Well, I got up there, and one thing I didn't know was... His wife, Pastor Lou, loved Elvis, and I did my impersonation of Elvis Presley singing, Well, since that devil left me, uh -uh," and I did all the moves, I found a new place to dwell. Well, down at the end of Holy Street, a whole gospel hotel, I'll get a soul, I'll get so holy, baby. And anyway, Lou stood up and said, do it again. (laughs) So I had to do it again. So the church really received me. It was great. And I did Edith and Archie Bunker. I did, I did a whole slew of impersonations. And, um, brother Jerry said to me, Dennis, I'm glad they took you off. I'm, I'm glad you stopped when you did because I was laughing so hard. I didn't know what was going to happen next. <laughs> and um, so that started our really deeper relationship with Dr. Savell and Miss Carolyn. And of course, when they opened up the school, I was a teacher in the school and I stayed with the church when they opened the church. And uh, that's, that's our connection. So, you know, that's a lifetime connection, which, you know, we would never leave. That's um, amazing. Yeah. Does, does I that love explain? That. No, that story is awesome. That's great. Oh, good. That's good. so cool. I, I'm always so curious how people come to this place. Like I, we were, I feel so blessed to find this place and I'm always curious how other people found it. Yeah. Cause we just, I, it was such a God thing to, to come here. And so hearing your story. Well, about, you know, when we saw brother Jerry preaching, I think it was, I'm almost positive. It was Washington DC. Uh, my wife turned to me and said, we're going to be friends with that man someday. And I say, yeah, okay. <laughs> Just like we're going to be friends with Ken Copeland. Yeah, right. yeah. And we did. We became friends with both of them. And That's they awesome. both ordained us. So, which was really very cool. But I, so cool. I love that meeting him also helped you like solidify your career and your, Absolutely. what you wanted to do, which Absolutely. is acting. And you still do it. But when did you get saved? When did you? Okay, so. I started working in all the soap operas in New York, Ryan's Hope, The Edge of Night, The Guiding Light, As the World Turns, um, all of them. Um, Then I started working with Sylvester Stallone in movies. Uh, My first big one was Raging Bull with Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci, Mm -hmm. um, directed by Martin Scorsese. So I was doing all of that. But I was getting stoned even more, even more. And even on the set, if I had to be on on the set at 6 in the morning, I was stoned at 5 in the morning. Um, and Carmen, uh, I forgot what year it was, but, um, she went to a 
Catholic charismatic meeting. And she asked me to go with her. And, you know, I would say, no, nah, I watch these people on television. And I would watch Christian television mm -hmm. getting stoned and just laughing, saying, what a bunch of phonies, look at this. <sighs> so it was amusement. So I wasn't getting anything out of yeah. it. And so she, when she asked me to go, I said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not going to go. Well, she asked her mom to go. So her and her mom at the ca Catholic charismatic meeting received the Lord. And then she met her best friend, happenstance. It was just an, an accident. Yeah. Which we don't believe in accidents or coincidences. And Jennifer asked Carmen to come to her church on a Wednesday night. And that was the charismatic kind of a, a church. And they spoke in tongues and everything. So Carmen came home. And she said, Dan, I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I said, hey, 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 knock it off. I'm watching television and I'm feeling good. Go in the bedroom and talk to yourself about it. I mean, I was really mean about the whole thing. So she started praying for me for two years. Wow. When she'd go to work in the morning, she'd leave a Bible scripture on her pillow. I turn over, there was a Bible scripture. And I went, Argh! first thing in the morning, I go out to the into the kitchen to make my coffee. On the refrigerated door was a Bible scripture. On the Wives. milk was a Bible See? scripture. Wives. Then she bought me a brand new coffee mug and it said on it, my cup runneth over. Yes. I, I mean, <laughs> and I tell people when I speak in churches, I tell them, you know, we had more Bible scriptures than we did cockroaches. <laughs> but um, so she continued to pray for me, continued to ask me. And I mean, she was really annoying. Then I really thought of divorcing her because I couldn't take it anymore. So one day she said to me, okay, I'll just, I'm going to ask you for the last time. There's a healing service at the church on Long Island. Would you like to go? I said, I'll tell you what, when is it? She said, tomorrow. I said, okay, <sighs> I'll tell you what I'll do. And while I'm snorting and smoking, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go just this once. Don't ever talk to me about it again. Don't ever invite me ever again. Don't ever pray for me ever again. She said, okay, all right, I promise I won't. I said, you promise, I have your word. She said, you've got my word. So the next day, for some strange reason, after 20 years of doing drugs, every day, I didn't get stoned. So it's, I didn't wake up with my joint and my coffee. I mm -hmm. just had my coffee. And I thought, well, I'll... I'll smoke something later. And I didn't understand any of this. You didn't really have a desire. The desire wasn't there that morning. No, I mean, I, I had the desire, but it was up here. Yeah. But my heart was saying, no, you don't want it. Don't yeah. Want it. And anyway, later that night or that day, uh, we got dressed and it, it was during the time of disco. So what I oh, thought nice. I'd do is I thought I'd, I, I thought I'd really um, embarrass her. So... <laughs> I had this jacket on, like a John Travolta jacket, and I put my um, my lapel collar way out here, and I opened my shirt up down to my navel. Oh my! And I had God. these chains on. <laughs> I'm listening, and <laughs> and I'm thinking they're not they they're not they they're gonna say to me you can't come into church, <laughs> and that's what I was hoping for. And on the way out there, she didn't say a word. She just looked at me, and I said are you ready? And I thought she was going to say no, but she, she looked at me and said, yeah, okay. And so we went out there and just before we walk in, I said, Oh, by the way, if anybody says, praise the Lord, hallelujah, or amen, I'm walking out. She said, all right. Now you go into a charismatic church. Nobody's going to say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. We walk in not one person. I could wow. not hear it. And I was hoping to hear it. Yeah. Did not hear any of it. And Carmen just introduced me to her friend. We sat there. Uh, we're sitting there. The music comes out, the music ministry. It was uh, a guitar player, bass player, uh, piano player, drummer, and four singers. I had never seen anything like that in my life. I grew up Catholic. We just had an organ player, mm -hmm. and they would play everything in the minor mode, so everything was down. Yeah. And this was one, two, three, four. Everybody jumped up, and they started dancing and clapping. And I'm sitting there I'm thinking, <laughs> what is this? So I stood up, and I was just standing there. But the music was really good. 
And I thought, you know, I could, I could you tap in your foot a little yeah, bit, I could get you know, into this. And then I thought, Oh, here's a perfect opportunity to embarrass Carmen. And I started dancing like, <laughs> like I was in a disco. <laughs> she didn't bat an eye. She was just praising the Lord, dancing, clapping, and everybody was doing the same. So when the music was over, Two pastors come out, Pastor Ernie and Pastor Dan. Pastor Ernie was a short little Italian guy. Pastor Dan was a tall Italian guy. Pastor Dan looked like an actor. His name is Larry Parks. And I remember seeing my father was playing the Al Jolson story when I was growing up. And I remember that. And that's who this guy looked like. And when he got up to preach, he was preaching from the King James Bible. Now, I had never heard that. I had never heard passage from the King James Bible. I thought he was doing sh something Shakespearean because it's King James. And so I, I'm thinking, whoa, this is pretty good. I'm not familiar with the work, but this is very cool. <laughs> so that's how it went. And then he called up Pastor Ernie at the end, and he said, okay, if you need a healing, whatever you need in your life, come on up. We're going to pray for you. And I'm thinking... I used, I'm not going to mention names, but I saw this on Christian television where people would get slain in the spirit mm -hmm. and they get healed. And I thought, that's a, it's phony. Nobody gets healed. God doesn't do that. So I turned to Carmen and I said, and I was laughing. I said, why don't you go up for a healing? And she said, I went up last week. Why don't you go up? Dang. And I'm thinking, moi? <laughs> but then, you know, I'm, I'm looking like John Travolta with me. <laughs> Shirt opened up down to here. So I go up to Pastor Dan. Who, he was nice and calm. Pastor Ernie, the little short Italian guy, he was so wild. He had fire coming out of his ears, smoke coming out of his nose. And I thought, I'm not going to him because he was, I mean, people were going down. I said, he's not going to do that to me because <laughs> I know he's pushing people. And, and by the way, my hair was so sprayed that I didn't want don't two touch things that you don't do to a guy from Brooklyn. Number one, you never touch his hair. Number two, never touch his face. I go up to Pastor Dan. I was the last one on his line. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And Pastor Ernie had nobody else on his line. And he yells out, come here, brother, I'll pray for you. <laughs> and I just ignored him. And then he said it again. And then I just went like this. <laughs> oh, jeez. He's talking to me. He said, yeah. And he saw me do that. He said, yeah, you, get over here. He said, uh, what's your problem? So I thought to myself, you and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, you need a healing. And I said, well, I have the stigmatism in my left eye, which I really did. And I couldn't, I, I tried to join the army. They wouldn't take me because of it. And uh, he said, lift your hands in there. I'm going to pray for you. And I said, what? He said, lift your hands in the air. I'm going to pray for you. I said, just pray for me. He said, no, you have to lift your hands in the air. That's how we do it in here. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to get out of here. So that's what I did. I held my hands very low like they were lifted up. Mm -hmm. And he said, lift them up higher, brother. I said, no, look, could you just pray for me? He said, okay, close your eyes. Now I'm thinking, oh, God, what <laughs> else is this guy going to ask me to do? As soon as I close my eyes... He grabbed my hands and he lifted them up. And my shirt was really tight, tucked in. When he lifted my hand up, my shirt came up out of my pants. And I'm thinking, oh, I was looking so cool. Well, nice, calm Pastor Dan grabbed my other hand and they both lifted my hands up. And now <laughs> my shirt is up out of my pants and I'm thinking, I'm in church and my belly button is showing. This is a sacrilege. <laughs> that's what you're thinking about. That, yeah. Priorities. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. what oh, you're yeah, thinking absolutely. about. <laughs> Plus, you know, I was one of those cool guys. And uh, so they prayed for me. I came back to my seat. And there's Carmen with her hands lifted up in the air. She's not even looking at me. Her eyes are closed. And she kept saying, thank you, Lord, for saving my husband. Thank you, Lord, for saving my husband. And I'm thinking, you call this saved? And just then... A woman came over to me, put her hands on my sh her hand on my shoulder, and I remember saying, "Jesus, if you're real, I want to see something now because I'm never coming back here." And her hand is on my shoulder, and just then, as soon as I said, "If you're real, show me," because I'm never coming back here, I had my eyes closed. It felt like my head opened up, and this white light went all the way down to the soles of my feet, and I just stood there. 
And I, I couldn't move. And all I said was, wow. I even said it backwards. I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> and this woman said, brother, Jesus has a word for you. And these words came out of her mouth. My son, I need you to do my work, but you've got to change your evil ways. When I heard that, I really thought the voice of Jesus was talking to me. I no longer heard her voice. I started crying. And the more I cried, the more it felt like this evil, this darkness, drugs, 20 years of drugs was coming out of me. And it felt like this white light just kept filling me up and filling me up. And that night, April 4th, 1981, about 10, 10 o'clock at night, in an instant, Jesus Christ came into my life, changed it, and delivered me from 20 years of drug addiction. That's amazing. From that yeah. moment on, I had no desire. I came back to, I turned around to Carmen, and I said, what just happened to me? She said, we'll talk in the car. Then everybody came over to me and said, hey, praise the Lord. How you doing, brother? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a friend of Carmen. I said, yeah, yeah, good. I, I didn't say praise the Lord or anything. I was saying, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good. And I was happy to hear it. So when we got into the car, she was talking to me. When we got home, we must have been, went to bed like 5 a.m. She was showing me scripture where you have to be born again to see the kingdom of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And she showed me all these scriptures. And man, it was, it was life, of course, life changing. But the next, but when I went to sleep, I said, I know I'm going to want to get stoned mm -hmm. tomorrow. And I really don't want to lose this feeling. Well, the next day came and I had a lot of pot in my closet. I had a lot of cocaine. I had like $3,000 worth of cocaine. I had pills. I had everything. And um, when I woke up, I was saying to myself, God, I don't want to lose this feeling. I don't want to lose this feeling. And Carmen had to go to work. And I knew I was going to be home alone. And I found the quarter of a pound of pot. And I just thought, okay, you know what? I could just do all of it right now. Mm -hmm. And then I'm done with it. And I literally heard this voice say, if I delivered you, why would you smoke it? And then I, I looked up and, you know, I wasn't one to hear voices or anything. Mm -hmm. Then I just thought, I'll send it, I'll sell it to my friend, Randy. He lives on the seventh floor. I could sell this easy for 150 bucks. And then I heard the voice say, if I delivered you, why would you sell it? Hmm. And then I rolled it up like a football. I was never good at sports in school. So I was by the closet when I took it down, when I rolled it up, there was a small garbage can just like that size over at the end near the kitchen. And I said, okay, God, if this is you, <laughs> I'm going to get this in and I'm going to throw it away. But I knew. You weren't going to get it. No, of course not. It went right into the garbage. <laughs> so I, I went to my whole house, took everything, papers, uh, pot, hashish, cocaine, pills, took everything, even my pipe, my, uh, my big bong, which I paid a lot of money for, threw everything in the incinerator. Wow. And that day forward, never went back to it, never had a desire for it. Whenever you get back into acting, you're now saved. You have this you know, you're, you're following the Lord and what he wants you to do. How do you take that into this industry? That is, I mean, it's a very ungodly industry. How mm -hmm. do you bring God to it? So this is how I look at it. I'm half Irish, half Italian. My name is Dennis O'Neill. Um, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I'm an actor. Um, what about that? Did you not get? And that's how I talk to people. So I don't make a big deal out of it. This is who I am, what mm -hmm. I do. Um, I don't ask anyone if they have a problem with me being half Irish or half Italian <laughs> or from New York. And I look at my walk with the Lord the same way. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's just a part of everything that we do. I was on a, a film set. Oh, this was very cool. So this was, a, I forgot the name of the movie, but there was about 15 of us. And we were all around just drinking our coffee. We had a, a break. And some guy said, um, hey, did, what, what sign are you? And 
you know, th they were going around and... What asked, sign, like your horoscope sign? Yeah, okay. your horoscope okay. sign. So when they got to me, I said, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> and so they, they started <laughs> laughing. And so I got their attention. And so as we were talking, this one guy said, you know, I got to tell you guys something, man. I'm having a hard time. Because they were talking about what they were into, mm -hmm. like Buddhism and all of this other, because they, of the sign. Yeah. And this one guy said, I got to tell you something. My wife was watching 700 Club. No, my girlfriend who was living with me was watching 700 Club when I went to work. And when I came home, she said, we can't sleep together anymore. And he said, why? And she said, I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior by television. And so they were going on and on. And here I am, a believer. Yeah. And I mean, I'm rejoicing about this. And they were laughing at her. Right. Then they went around asking each person. There was about 15 of us what you're into. And this guy was saying Buddhism, this guy astrology, this guy, whatever mm -hmm. he was into. Then they got to me and they said, so what are you, what are you into? And I said, well, <clears throat> it's interesting that you should talk about the 700 club. I said, because my wife did the same thing and she started praying for me and I was laughing yeah. like I was in on what they're in on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they thought I was going to go a different route with it. And I said, yeah, I couldn't believe she did all this. And they said, man, so what'd you do? Then I said, and that night, April 4th, 1981, Jesus Christ came into my life and changed me. And I'm a totally different man. I'm no longer on 20 years of drug addiction. I'd, I'd have no desire to drink alcohol or anything like that. And these guys were staring at me and this one big guy came over to me and said, man, I don't know if we all believe what you believe, but he took my hand. He said, thank you very much for sharing that. And then they called us back to the set. Does that happen often where you're able to share yes. that with yes, actors? Yes, it did. Because I would always pray, um, and especially when I was Robin Williams' stunt double, I remember praying, Lord, if I could have a pulpit. Now, I'm not going to preach to people, mm -hmm. but if I have a pulpit to just share, mm -hmm. then keep this door open. And yeah. if you see that I don't have a, a door open to share, what's the reason for me being there yeah. other than just working? So I want more of what I'm doing. God always held that door open. And somebody would come up and say to me, what do you do? I had a woman, I was cast in this TV show and it was a really good role. And this woman said, to, and this is, oh, this was, I got out of acting for about seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. So this was a first that I'm going back into. As soon as I got onto the set, this woman came up to me and said, what are you into? I said, what do you mean? <laughs> she said, well, what do you do? So well, I'm an actor. She said, yeah, but you do something else. And I didn't say anything to her because I wanted to be very, I, I wanted to be, very cautious the way I, I deliver my message. Yeah. I don't want to come on like a gangbuster. Glory to God, you're going to hell, <laughs> sister. Yeah. And um, so I waited a few days and she came over to me again. She said, listen, I really have to know what you do. And I said, why? She said, because there's something about you. I said, okay, listen. I looked around, I said, I'm a minister undercover. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, what? What do you mean? I said, well, I don't share it with everyone because if I tell everyone that I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm a minister, mm -hmm. they're not going to want to talk to me. Yeah. And she said, well, I want to hear what you have to say. Well, I, I said, well, what do you want to hear? She said, I'll tell you what I want to hear. I've been observing you for days now and I've been convicted. She said, years ago, I gave my life to the Lord. Right now, I'm living with my boyfriend. And when I met you, I went home and I looked at him in a different light. And she said, I just thought it was wrong. And she said, so um, I need to talk to you about it. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Let's just pray. Mm -hmm. And she said, absolutely. So we prayed mm -hmm. and I asked God to give her guidance and, you know, decision making. The next day she came to the set. She said, I've got to tell you something. I told my boyfriend he had to move out. And last night, we have a two-bedroom two apartment. Mm -hmm. Last night, he slept in the other bedroom. And he's moving into his mom's today. And I said, okay. And she said, and we're getting married 
in just a couple of months. And she said, thank you very much. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that the goal is to like have people see that on you without even needing to hear it? Like that is the, that is Mm -hmm. the goal and what we we should look like, what should we should act like? Yeah. Okay. So we get home and I did get a call to do that TV show, but I also got a call from a comedy club called the funny bone, Hmm. which is still there in Arlington. It's well known. And the guy said, hey, man, I heard you're a funny guy and you do impersonations. I said, well, yeah, I do. He said, so what's the impersonate? I heard that you do Elvis. I said, yeah, uh, but, you know, I do it a little differently. I said, I do it as if they're going to church. (laughs) He said, I don't care what you do. As long as you do it, would you play at my my comedy club? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, when? So he told me. So I went down there and. I started, I started sharing my testimony Mm -hmm. and in this comedy club, in this comedy club, Mm because I didn't know what else to do. Yeah. And then I did my Elvis. When I did my Elvis, women stood up and I was singing (laughs) gospel hotel. Mm -hmm. Please. Okay. But please tell me you did the resurrection, the, and no, that's the one thing I didn't do, do, but but let me, I'll, I'll tell you what I did do when I was done. I, I had to say this and I, I said, um, I want to thank you all for having me, and I want to thank the owner for having me. And uh, I could have never done this without receiving Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, and God bless you. So listen to this. I'm walking out in the foyer. I see this guy walking back and forth, and he's in front of the door, and he's not going to let me out. And I said, excuse me. He said, no. no. I said, I, I have to leave. Excuse me. He said, no, I have to talk to you. I said, what's up? I didn't know what he was going to say about my show. He said, um, years ago, I was a Christian, and I got away from the Lord, and all my comedy is dirty. He said, I've never seen this before. I want to get back to it. Would you pray for me? And I prayed. I got the chills. And I prayed for him right then and there. And when I got home, I said to Carmen, this is what I want to do. Yeah. This is just what I want to do. If churches don't call me anymore, I know where my ministry is. Yeah. So this is what I want to do. And God will open the doors for you. And and that that's what happened with Robin Williams. You know, when I got it, did I tell you guys? No, I this I was gonna say let's not because you mentioned you were his stunt, stunt double. I was, I was like, like yeah. can we get? Ba- I want to get back to that. I want to hear a little that. more of that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have a lot of those stories. Robin so Williams' I'm gonna stunt double. I'm going you guys kind of guide me and direct me. Mm-hmm. But um, so there was uh, th- there was a call for Robin Williams' stunt double, and oh, his stand-in, not stunt double, mm. stand-in. That's and, a real job. What's that? Yeah. You just stand there while he's not there. Yes. Well, what you do is, so they set the cameras and lights up. Why would I know that? And (laughs) as long as you resemble him, you have the same hair coloring and everything else, you stand in front of it. Then you give them some lines. They get the the sound check on it and the lighting and everything else. And that's, I'm considered the second team. Then the first team, Robin, comes in and he does everything. Which is so cool, by the way. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Such a cool job. I figured, let me get there early because there's going to be a line around the block. I mean, Robin Williams yeah. was so hot at the time. I mean, his name was really there. And um, so I got when there. Was the, what year was this that you were doing? Do you remember? Or do you remember the movie? I think it was 83. Okay. okay. I think it was 83. It was called The Survivors. Okay. And so I got there a little early and I, I couldn't find the place because usually when an actor goes on an audition, you follow the crowd. Mm-hmm. You see the big crowd, you know, mm-hmm. that's the place. There was no crowd. So I'm looking at what I wrote down and <laughs> I go up there and- This was before MapQuest or before uh, Google? I said MapQuest. Yeah. Wow. I said MapQuest. <laughs> It was. Wow. I meant before, was this pre Thomas Guide? Was this pre Thomas Guide? Uh, okay. Yeah. I meant before. What is it? Uh, oh. Google, <laughs> wow. Google Maps. Well, you, I, yeah, you okay. have. I am a millennial. I use that's MapQuest. That's like the nicest thing you've ever so said. Sorry. Was that pre MapQuest? <laughs> it's, it's the time of the what book, is, the map oh book. Oh my god. god. Yeah. Oh, that is so so, um, so okay. I I got there and there's no one there. And the door is open for the casting director, and I don't see anybody in there. So I knock on the door, and I say, hello. And she says, who's it? Who is it? I said, is this the place for the Robin Williams 
uh, stand in. She said, yeah, I'll be right out. There was nobody there. Wild. Okay. Not one person except me. <laughs> and I said, I'm here for the, she said, oh, wait a she looks me up and down, and this is what I did. Do you remember, um, oh, his TV show? Um, Mork and Mindy? Mork and Mindy. Remember? I do remember it. Okay, so this is what I did. I said, nano, nano. And she, this is what she did. She looked me up and down. She said, you got the job. I went, oh. Like easiest audition ever. Best the interview, easiest you know for, a, I mean, a big for movie Robin star. Williams. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and all right. And he was only getting bigger. Yes. What's that? And he was no. only getting bigger. No, it, it it really doesn't. I mean, I worked with. with no, I mean, like he, his career was his on the. His career like, was like, on like, that. Yeah. Oh, like a man, skyrocketing from big that time. point. Yeah. 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 I mean, I worked with Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci, and uh, that was pretty exciting. But working with Robin, Robin was the the best thing I've ever done. I gotta tell. I don't think Addie life. knows that. I gotta tell her that. That what? you were Robin oh. Williams' stand-in. Oh, she yeah, likes him yeah. too. That's awesome. Well, then, uh, as we're on the set, um, we went up to Vermont, and we weren't getting enough snow, and they were going to have to uh, move to Lake Tahoe. And um, But before that happened, I was at lunch, and they couldn't get his stunt double from L.A. to Vermont in time. So they came over to me during lunch and said, uh, hey, do you do stunts by any chance? I said, stunts? Yeah. Did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done a stunt in my life. They said, wait a minute, you really, you do? I said, yeah, I started in, in high school. I was on the, the gymnastics team. I, I was wasn't. on the stunt team in my high school. I wasn't. I mean, I did something in gymnastics, but I flopped big time. And they said, okay, well, look, um, we want you to be his stunt double. I said, okay, uh, what do I have to do? And then they said, well, tomorrow you're going to fall through a frozen lake. And my heart no. sank. I went, oh, okay. Easy. Done. I didn't know what I was doing at <laughs> all. I mean, how do I fro fall into a frozen lake? You <laughs> fall into a frozen lake, the current will take you yeah. under. I didn't know. And then they said, you're going to get shot at a few times. And then you're going to climb this wall. And good thing I was, re I was in great shape. So uh, the first day... They take me t to the frozen lake. Had you met him, by the way, at this point? You'd already met oh, him. Oh, yes. And so to him? I already met Robin, uh -huh. and we, we just hit it off. Yeah. So um, then I'm going to tell you how I got to share my testimony with him, which is was really great. So um, we, we're... I'm, I'm doing this. They cut out a 42 inch hole in the ice and they said, so what you're going to do is uh, we're going to give you a wetsuit. So they're telling me what's happening, how to do it. And they said, and when you fall in, it's very buoyant, as you know. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. So it'll bring me to the top. Of course, he said buoyant to the top. Of right. course. I said, yeah, yeah. Have you ever done this before? <laughs> not a problem. I didn't, I didn't lie to him. I didn't <laughs> say yes. I just said not a problem. So they're telling me what to do. So I fall through the frozen lake, yada, yada, yada. I get paid more money when you do a stunt. And I said to him, I said, well, let's do it again, you know, just so we have a safety. He said, you really want to do it again? I said, yeah, I'm getting paid more money. <laughs> so we did it. Now, I had already been a Christian. Mm -hmm. So uh, and people told me in church, don't take this job. So I said to my wife, I said, don't tell them where I am. Mm -hmm. Just tell them I had to go on a business trip. For three months. For three months. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I did all of that. And now we're in New York City um, because on the way back at the end of that, that film, on the way back, Robin Williams and I really hit it off. And I didn't ask for pictures and, you know, autographs and yeah. things like that. And, and he really appreciated that. So we're on our way back to base camp were the only ones mm -hmm. walking back. And I didn't know why we were the only ones on the road walking back. It was up in Vermont. And he said to me, um, what are you doing in January? I said, um, Robin, I'm a, I'm an actor. I don't know. Yeah. He said, well, I'm doing another movie. You, you want to be in it? You want to be my stunt double again? And I said, well, let me think about it. Yeah. <laughs> and so he <laughs> laughed just like that. He laughed right away. And, uh, Robin, we took a break and it was on East 6th Street in Manhattan on the Lower East Side. And it was just like it was a movie setup. There was somebody threw a couch out and it was on 
on the street. So I sat on the arm of it, and there was this street lamp. It was late at night, and it, it looked like a setup for a, the next scene, mm-hmm. but it wasn't. It had nothing to do with the, the film. So I'm reading my Bible, and Robin comes over, and I look up, and he said, um, he touched my Bible. That's what he did. He patted it and said, what are you into? Are you Jehovah's Witness? And I closed my Bible. I said, no. And I said, well, I witnessed for Jehovah, but I'm not a Jehovah's <laughs> Witness. <laughs> so, And he didn't know what I meant. Yeah. So then he asked me what I was into. <clears throat> and I heard the Holy Spirit leading me to share my testimony. Mm-hmm. And I knew if he did not like what I was about to say, I am fired yeah. in an instant. And I was kind of brushing the Holy Spirit off in my mind saying, get out of here, <laughs> get thee behind me. That never goes over well, does no, it? No, <laughs> not at all. And, you know, I didn't know how to start this conversation with Robin. So I just said, well, you know, my wife tried, he, she, my wife got me to go to church and, you know. Always blaming we, it on the wife. Yeah, I yeah. did. <laughs> and And that was so easy. And then I said to him, uh, as I'm sharing my testimony, I said, but Robin, can you imagine, you know, Stallone, Rocky going to church? He said, well, I, I don't know what you mean. So I said, hey, yo, Adrian, how you doing? Yo, Adrian, I'm <laughs> saved. So Robin started to laugh. And then I did my Popeye for him. Mm-hmm. Then I did Edith and Archie Bunker. Cheese, Edith, you ding bat. <laughs> what are you doing now? Going to church, Archie. And now Robin. <laughs> Rob, yeah. Well, I'm doing it. I'm yeah. doing it for, for the best. Robin Williams, the, yeah. yeah, the best comedian in the world. Yeah. And so he is laughing. And then I did Elma Fudd. Oh, oh, my name is Elma Fudd. If you see the wabbit, tell him I love him. <laughs> and now Robin, and he wanted to get in on this. I could see that he wanted to get in on it. And then I said, and then I shared my testimony, how the Lord came into my heart, came into my life, and how I was changed. And I said, Robin, that night, I was delivered from 20 years of drug addiction. And today I live for Jesus Christ. And he's staring at me. And he reaches over and grabs my hand and said, Dennis, I want to thank you. No one has ever talked to me like this before. And that's when, that's when he asked me mm-hmm. to be on his next movie, which was, um, oh, he played the defector. The Russian defector, Moscow on the Hudson. Mm, okay. And, uh, and that was a very cool story. First day, we're all there. There's about 50 of us, camera people, actors and everything. We're in this big room and everyone's waiting for Robin. So Robin finally shows up and he comes into the room and he's looking around like this. And we didn't know what he was looking for. We were looking around. Look, he was looking around, looking around. And he catches my eye. He said, brother. And he came running over to me, and gave me this <laughs> big hug. And I thought, wow, it was kind of embarrassing yeah. because all these other actors are in the room. They're, they're and drooling. The, yeah. you know, we want to be that close to Robin. So I got the job and I worked with him for another three or four months. Mm-hmm. And it was just absolutely great. When Robin Williams passed away, um, it was on the news and Billy Crystal was giving his eulogy and Billy Crystal said, if Robin liked you, he never shook your hand. He just gave you the biggest bear hug. And man, I remember he didn't shake my hand. Yeah. He gave me the biggest bear hug. And that really blessed me. And I, I remember, I forgot to add this, that night when I shared my testimony with Robin, I just blurted out. I said, Robin, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he died for your sins and he was raised from the dead? And he looked down. He said, my mother's a Christian. My father's Jewish. Then he looked up and said, yeah, I do believe that. And that's when I said, Robin, the Bible says that if you confess that before men, you you shall see the kingdom of heaven. And that's when I said to him, I believe I'm going to see you in in heaven someday. And that's when he took my hand and shook, and I forgot to add that. But a month month or two before he died, and it was a month before he died, a pastor got a hold of Robin Williams 
and said the prayer again, again. with him, mm-hmm. but really led him into the prayer. Mm-hmm. And Robin Williams received Jesus Christ as, a, as his I Lord and that. Savior. Yeah. Right. That's, yeah. That's why you do what you do, though. For moments like that, that's why you're in that industry. That's why, I mean... It's hard. I'm sure it's difficult to talk to actors about God because like mm-hmm. I said, it's like a it's a very ungodly industry, but yeah, that's why you're in it and that's why you do what you do. Well, Powerful. you know, Proverbs 18, 6, 18, 16 says, a man's gift will make room for him and bring him before great men. Mm-hmm. Well, every acting class that I have, that's how I end it. Yeah. And I always say, tonight, God took my gift, brought me before great men and great women. You are great. Don't forget it. I love you and I get out of here. <laughs> so. <laughs> so you've done all this work in acting in this industry. You've met, I mean, awesome people, obviously brought people to the Lord. What are you doing now? I know that you have a TV show that you direct, produce, you do all the things on it, act in it. Um, yeah. And a lot of your actors, like in your acting class are also in it. And you, you have this show. I want to hear what you're doing now in the industry. And then also what's to come. What are you? So what I do now is when time permits, I, I speak in churches. So I haven't gotten away from that, but I've incorporated my acting into ministry. I'm tired of putting my life and career into somebody else's hands. who They don't know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So I went home and I started writing and I was writing this TV show, Bailout. And I had a different name for it at the time. But as I'm writing it, I'm writing and writing. I got actors interested in wanting to do it. So we did our first But it's, tri- a, it's like, it's a uh, Christian based TV show. It's so I don't call it Christian. I, I, Actually, I don't even tell people it's faith-based. Mm-hmm. I tell them, well, just watch it. <laughs> so um, it, it is faith-based. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have angels in it. I have um, I have a, a priest in it. And, and I did some research. And the way you can get people to watch what you're doing, if you put a white Anglo minister or evangelist in it, you're going to turn away maybe 50% of your audience. But if you get a Catholic priest or a black minister, Mm -hmm. people are open to that. And so I want to be very wise about it. So I have, um, I have Mm -hmm. a Catholic priest in it who shares scripture and I have these angels, uh, who are watching over my character. And, uh, when I, when I first started writing it, it was totally secular Although it was family based, mm-hmm. it was clean. Um, you know, I didn't think in terms of faith based or anything like that. So we did our first trailer, which was about four minutes, which is a little long, four and a half minutes, which was a little long for a trailer. Mm-hmm. But uh, we did it, and I was very proud of it. And I put it into festivals, and we got a lot of re- recognition. And you're still getting awards for this. Okay, so. so up to yesterday, because people keep asking me, how many awards have you won? So I, we were nominated, given awards, selected, and everything else, 76. Awards alone, 34. It's amazing. Wow. Best actor, nine. Which, amazing. you know, I'm, I'm totally amazed that because, you know, I came from Brooklyn. I was not a smart kid at all. I couldn't <laughs> write. I couldn't do any of this stuff. So, you know, I, even though I, I received the Lord and that's when I went back to school and I saw, I saw more of myself of who I was in Christ and my purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, I just started writing. I just said, Lord, I'm just going to depend on you as I've been doing all these years. So I started writing and I said, Lord, I don't know where you want me to go with this show. If you want it to be faith-based, totally Christian, whatever you want, just show me. I don't know what to do. I'm the pen of the ready writer. You start writing. Here we go. I started writing. I didn't know what I was going to write. I'm writing. As I'm writing, I'm starting writing these scenes. I'm laughing. I'm going, oh my gosh, oh, this is so funny. All the And before you knew it, I had a whole script. Then I put the angels in it. Yeah. I put the priest in it. And I said, Lord, if you want it faith-based, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just not going to call it faith-based right. because touched by an angel was not called faith-based. 
but it was yeah. obviously a faith-based yeah. project. Yeah. But it was on NBC, I think, and you know, won awards and yeah. won people over. And that's what I want to do with Bailout. And then I started writing. Now, that's all comedy. Then I started writing A Time for Love. And that's about the Sullivan family, Pastor John Sullivan, his wife, and his two daughters, and everything that they go through. So in one episode, my wife, even though she's a pastor's wife, she's battling with depression. So we do this whole episode on depression. And just to let people know out there, you know, you can be a pastor, you can be saved, yeah. you can be a Christian, and you're still battling these yeah. things. And that's what I wanted to do. Then we did another one on my daughter being killed by my other daughter being killed by a drunk driver. And the grief that we go through and how we go through it. The next one, which we combine the both of them, which will be our first half hour. Um, the the guy that killed our daughter, they found him. He's in prison and he wants to see us. Now we have to go through, how do we forgive this Those guy? Those are intense stories. Oh, they're very intense. And actually, when I, was, when I was writing some of it, I literally was crying. I mean, I literally was crying. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, in the scenes, we're all crying. Yeah. And, but it's just an acting thing that we have to do. And uh, so it's how we forgive him and how we lead him to the Lord. And then he dies. That's good. That is, that is like super powerful like in, in terms of those concepts, those ideas that, I mean, gosh, to, to I don't be in that, those moments. To be in that moment, to, like, yeah. I, I can't even imagine what that pain would be like. To, and then that, yes. you know, to live in that forgiveness. Acting then, is a hard job. Ugh, right? Yeah. Thank the Lord I'm not doing that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's your calling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I have a question for you that we ask every single person, and, and I think it's a, a great thing to ask after hearing what you're doing and how you're doing it in such cool, cool ways that are just, I think it's super exciting. But here at Heritage, we have our motto, which is making winners in life. Yeah. That, that is something that, that we believe in strongly, and we'd like to know what does that mean to you? What, is, what does that phrase, that concept, that idea mean to you personally? Well, you, you know, as, as long as I can contain my belief system, as long as I stay on, on the road of going up and only looking, you know, I, one of my pastors, my pastor back in New York said, never go back to the old country, meaning never live in your past. The only time you go back to the old country is when you're going to preach the gospel. So I always remember where I come from. I never look back, but I know that I have a review mirror and I know that I have a window back there, but I keep my eyes straight ahead out of the windshield uh, and looking where I'm going. And I always am brought back to where I came from. My brother posts on Facebook, he's so proud of me, my <laughs> older brother. He called me about a year ago and he said to me, you know, mom and dad are no longer around. And they're not here to see all the accolades and the successes that you've been attaining because, you know, I, I mean, I told you guys that I quit school and then I went back to college. I, I graduated with honors. Mm -hmm. I got my associates. Then when I came here, I went to UT, I, I graduated with honors and I never dream. I didn't even know that I graduated with honors a year ago. And he said, since mom and dad aren't here uh, to tell you how proud they are of you, and to show you the love, he said, I'm taking their place. Sweet. And I said to him, do you want me to cry now or later? <laughs> Both, and please. that really touched my heart. Now, I've been ministering to my family for years. My brother today, he'll, he'll, he'll call me and he'll quote scripture now. That's, That's how awesome. much of a believer he is. <laughs> and we have these great talks. My two sisters receive the Lord. Um, so that's a part of the winning streak mm -hmm. in my life. And of course, where I am now, I told you that, you know, we, we won, we were nominated and got selected 76 times and we won 34 awards. Wow. I keep going back to when I was a kid, I never yeah. even thought that was possible because of where 
I came from. Um, and then to see people contact me because of what I won. Mm -hmm. And I always say, now they're going to hear my life. Mm -hmm. And I never let them go, yeah. you know, and, and God always, I'm, I'm always asking God, God puts him something on their heart for them to ask me a question. Because I used to speak in public schools mm -hmm. and you could never, I, I told the kids that I was on drugs and things like that, but I could never tell them how I got off drugs unless they asked ask, me a question. Yeah. So I asked God, show me how to, if, if they're not going to ask me a question, show me how to lead them into asking mm -hmm. that question. And they would. Then I'd share, share about Jesus God. Christ. And when we went to Ukraine with Bill Bazansky, Dr. Bill Bazansky, we could not, we did a play called... Um, the witness, Jesus on trial, mm -hmm. that I that I wrote, and at the end I do this altar call, but I was wasn't allowed to do it. Even though the KGB, they said the KGB was no longer there, there were two men with sunglasses, hats, smoking two cigarettes, just like you see in a movie, on stage. They were on stage with the actors, and they were just making sure that I do not have. Uh, an altar call. So I said to the whole crowd, if you'd like to meet the man that got me off drugs, I'll be at this church tomorrow morning. Why don't you come wow. on out? And then we would have the altar calls. So when I sp spoke in schools, do the same thing. I'd have a church and uh, I would, I, I would tell the kids and whoever else wanted to come out and meet the man. Well, <laughs> the principal of this one school said, well, why don't you just have it here? Don't have it at the church because Nobody will go out to the church. He said, have it here. I said, in the auditorium? He said, yeah. I said, okay. Okay. That night, it was a Friday night. I didn't know how many were going to show up. The place was, the auditorium was packed. Packed. I had an altar call. And he said, you could do it because it's after school. I had an altar call. The principal, assistant principal, 300 kids and teachers came up to receive the Lord. That's awesome. That's Those winning. are the winning <laughs> yeah. victories in my life. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank this you. was so this fun. I loved hearing about right? it. Yeah, loved it. Uh, we were so honored to have spent this time with you. Thank you. In the show notes audience, will there will be links for his shows, all of his work and more. So come back next week for more winning conversations.